Welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody had a nice holiday season and a nice new year and actually got uh, at least a little bit of um, rest in. I'm Howard Chansky. I'm the chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, and this is uh, January 2023 um, Grand Rounds. And our um, topic uh, today, uh, perhaps um, um, fittingly, is going to be on uh, the subject of um, sleep hygiene and um, sleep medicine. Um, which I think is uh, apropos for uh, the the stress that we all experience and how hard we all um, work at our jobs. Um, the title of the excuse me, the title of the talk is going to be "Effects and Management of Sleep Deprivation for Healthcare Pre Professionals," and it's been organized by Dr. Prabhakar, who is one of our R fours who. Um, also has set up a nice lineup for um, Grand Rounds this year. And then uh, Dr. Janice Cates, who's a clinical psychologist in the sleep behavioral health team um, at the VA. And uh, Dr. Irina Lee, um, who is an advanced psychology fellow on the sleep behavioral health team also um, at the VA. And before we start, I had one um, announcement and that was a kudo for Dr. Kevin Koo. Uh, and this is um, really a nice note. Um, not to mention the wonderful experience with Dr. Kevin Koo in the Harborview Emergency Department. Dr. Koo and the nurse really helped answer all of my family's questions and helped calm my mother's nerves on the day of the accident. Uh, so uh, Dr. Koo, uh, thank you for that. And with that, we will have Dr. Prabhakar uh, begin grand rounds. All right, thank you, Dr. Shansky. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pooja Prabhakar. I'm a fourth year orthopedic resident here at the University of Washington. And this morning, I'm joined by clinical psychologists, Dr. Janice Cates and Irina Lee, who work in the field of sleep psychology here at the Puget Sound VA. And we're going to discuss sleep de deprivation among healthcare professionals, including its effects and management. And I'll start with a very brief introduction by going over some literature on sleep de deprivation, specifically in physicians and surgeons. And then I'll leave most of the time to the experts, Drs. Katz and Lee, to use most of the time to discuss the general sleep deprivation effects and then focus on management tips that we can all implement. I have no disclosures. So sleep depriv deprivation is defined in several ways, including being a condition of suffering from a lack of sleep or not getting the recommended amount of sleep or getting less than seven hours of sleep per night. And it's not breaking news that physicians as a group get less than the average recommended hours of sleep. And we've probably all been at a point like this where we've wanted to sleep on an empty stretcher post-call. So just to go over some of the studies, there's been numerous studies in physicians, surgeons, and orthopedic surgeons specifically regarding the amount of sleep per night. So this study out of Houston Methodist in 2018 included 21 orthopedic surgeons and residents who wore a validated wearable device that measures sleep quantity and quality over four weeks. And they found that 66% of surgeons and residents slept less than seven hours a night, with the average hours being about 6.5 hours. And they found a moderate negative correlation with total sleep for the total hours worked. And of their total sleep, 17.7% was in REM sleep. And usually the typical REM percentage in health, healthy adults is between 20 to 25%. Another recent study published in the Journal of American College of Surgeons similarly used sleep tracking devices to record sleep patterns among 17 acute care general surgery attendings and found similar, similar results. The average sleep per night when excluding when they were on in-house call was 6.54 hours and 64.8% of the sleep patterns were categorized as acute or chronic sleep deprivation. They also found that the average amount of sleep was higher on post-call day one, which was still only 6.96 hours compared to post-call day two, which was 6.33 hours. So again, there's a large volume of literature on effects of sleep deprivation, which my co-presenters will touch on. And within the healthcare field, there's been many studies that have shown that the sleep deprivation that is common in the field can lead to impaired memory consolidation, impaired decision-making, increased medical errors, increased medication or prescription writing errors, increased adverse events. And there's also some conflicting evidence on effects on adverse outcomes and complications. 
So specifically on the effects of sleep deprivation among orthopedic surgeons, there was this paper that was published in JBJS out of the University of Maryland in 2012 that prospectively studied the performance of 32 orthopedic trauma surgeons, including residents and fellows, over two four-week periods using validated cognitive and psychomotor function tests. They found that those who slept four hours or less the night before, the test had 1.43 times the odds of committing at least one error on an individual test compared to a surgeon who slept more than four hours. And they had a 72% increased chance of making at least one error on the running memory test. A recent study in the Swartz surgery literature assessed orthopedic residents' performance in simulator arthroscopy before and after 24 hour shift. They included 120 simulator trials of shoulder arthroscopy, including subacromial decom uh, decompression by 10 orthopedic residents in the study over the course of six months. And the overall performance score, which included operating time, proportion of procedures with iatrogenic lesions, as well as camera path length, was significantly lower after a 24 hour night shift. So there are other downstream effects of sleep deprivation, such as increased surgeon burnout, depression, anxiety, which can be compounded by the downstream effects of medical errors that can also lead to physician suicide. Another noted effect of sleep deprivation as well, um, as well as on people who work night shifts is increased risk of driving accidents. So at this point, I'll go ahead and transition over to the sleep experts, Dr. Katz and Dr. Lee, who'll give us a broader discussion of sleep and sleep deprivation, as well as things we can do to manage it. All right, thank you. Um, again, I'm Janess Cates and thanks for having me today. Dr. Lee was unfortunately last minute unable to make it this morning, um, but she did help me with this presentation. Um, and just a little bit about us, we're clinical psychologists, we're part of the um, behavioral health team that's embedded within sleep medicine um, at the Puget Sound VA. Um, I'm um, new over here in the team. I'm a transplant from um, Boston recently. And um, so, and this model of care is kind of um, new, but it's really helpful because a lot of sleep disorders have a big behavioral aspect. So we're doing a lot of treating um, mostly insomnia, uh, but also nightmares and um, helping people adjust to uh, things like PAP therapy. Um, so also we are VA employees, but this does not represent the opinions of the VA or the federal government, and we have no um, disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, and I'll just say real quickly that after college pre-grad school, I worked as a, uh, we call them MSAs in the VA, but kind of um, receptionist secretary in orthopedics. So um, I was excited that you all in particular invited us here um, to be back with the orthopedic crowd. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of sleep 101. Um, I think a lot of this will be review for most of you, but I think can be important background for understanding um, some of the effects of sleep deprivation and um, what to do. And then we'll talk about sleep deprivation and we'll talk about tips for better sleep and managing sleep deprivation. Um, so I think the, uh, long and short of it is we need to sleep. Sleep is really important. It's not something that we can just cut out. It's essential for the, our functioning, um, and has really a huge impact on, um, the functioning of our memory, our thinking, our mood, our attention, immune system, our ability to recharge our mind and body, metabolism, learning, really everything, um, you know, sleep is a central aspect to, um, to our functioning. Um, and it's really sort of a, our, our nightly rinse and repeat cycle that helps us maintain our brain and our body and our functioning. So what happens when we don't get sleep? 
Um, and uh, we're defining sleep deprivation here as a period of uh, prolonged wakefulness, such as overnight. Um, and there's a lot of different kind of terminology out there. We're calling um, sleep restriction as the chronic reduction of sleep time of less than or equal to six hours a night, but you'll also see chronic sleep deprivation versus acute sleep, sleep deprivation, um, partial sleep deprivation. Uh, so just for clarity, we're going to call it that sleep deprivation versus sleep restriction, more chronic. But sleep restriction has um, uh, similar effects to sleep deprivation. Um, but it's a little bit harder to study, as you would imagine. Um, it's you can convince people to stay in the lab and keep them up all night, but um, to reduce their sleep over a long period of time, much harder to study. So a lot of that research is more correlational. Um, but we do find just to touch a little bit on kind of chronic sleep deprivation or sleep restriction um, that. Uh, cognitive performance is also impaired. Um, but if you only have one night of sleep deprivation, it can bounce back a little bit quicker, but takes more time if you've had this longer term sleep restriction. All right, so some of the effects, which are, as we talked about, sleep has really a central um, central role in a lot of our functioning. So um, the effects of sleep deprivation are also broad. Um, first, in terms of physiological effects and immune functioning, um, sleep deprivation has a negative impact on our nervous system, increasing sympathetic nervous system activity and decreasing parasympathetic activity. Uh, it also impacts cardio health, increasing blood pressure and heart rate. So those are the, some of the reasons why we see a lot of um, physical effects down the road from sleep deprivation and sleep restriction. Um, and then attention and processing speed progressively deteriorates over time. So the longer you're awake for days and days, potentially, the worse it's going to get. And the same with, um, you know, chronic um, shorter sleep. Um, you're going to see declines over time in attention and processing speed, uh, decreased ability to have sustained attention, so to be able to kind of concentrate on a task, um, and decreased reaction times. Um, and there's been some research that um, essentially sleep deprivation effects are um, similar to the effects of alcohol, so being drunk. Um, uh, so and um, I've seen some other people talk about that in terms of, you know, some of the dangers of that. You wouldn't want to drive drunk. You wouldn't want your doctor to be drunk. Um, so if the effects are similar with sleep deprivation, do you want um, someone who's sleep deprived uh, providing your care? Um, also affects uh, negative effects on learning and memory, problem solving, and then judgment and decision making is a big one. Um, sleep deprivation can lead to prioritizing short-term rewards, difficulty with delayed gratification, and increased risk-taking. Um, what also falls under here, there's some interesting crossover between the sleep literature and kind of um, eating literature and weight gain, stuff like that, because we do tend to when we're sleep deprived um, in lab studies where they kind of sleep deprived people, people are more likely to choose sugary and fatty foods, as well as eat more calories overall when they're sleep deprived. Um, and that has also been shown in kind of chronic um, chronic sleep restriction as well, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? Our body's like, I just need some quick energy right now. <laughs> um, so um, making, leading to making those sorts of decisions, which can of course lead to weight gain and all of these things down the line. All right, we also have effects on mental health and mood, um, increased negative emotions, such as anger, confusion, irritability is a big one that uh, I think is the most obvious one that people are just like not pleasant to be around when they haven't gotten enough sleep. Um, but we also see decreased emotional intelligence and ability to perceive emotions and in others. So 
in kind of lab studies, we see that if um, if people are sleep deprived and they're shown um, kind of a neutral situation or a neutral facial expression, people are more likely to view them as negative. So we're kind of have a negative bias um, when we're sleep deprived, which of course is really important because if someone's you know, coming at us and they're just trying to ask us a question and we're responding with like, why are you attacking me? Um, that's probably going to have an impact on, on, um, on our relationships, on our day to day as well. We also see decreased empathy um, and that's been shown in, in medical residents and, and research in that area as well, that kind of the longer you go on throughout the shift, the longer you've been awake, um, the, the lower your empathy gets and your ability to kind of understand um, where people are coming from. Um, also self-regulation and coping. So your ability to respond to stressful and negative situations is, uh, could be negatively impacted. And then long-term in terms of chronic sleep deprivation, sleep restriction, so not getting enough sleep per night, so four to six hours or less um, a night for a long period of time, um, you may be at risk for alcohol and substance problems, mental illness, and burnout, which of course is very important uh, for us in healthcare. All right. I think Pooja did a great job going over sleep deprivation for medical professionals. I think she covered um, a lot of this. Um, so I think, um, the only things I will add is that there has been a combination really of, um, real life research and also lab research that has shown overall that there are negative effects of sleep deprivation for medical professionals. A lot of the research has been with residents, but there is a fair amount with surgeons. And then she covered the kind of couple of studies that specifically focus on orthopedic surgeons. Um, and I think the one thing that I will add too is that there are risks um, to yourself, not only medical uh, errors and things like that, but also there's increased, it's been shown that um, medical professionals, drowsy driving leads to more vehicle accidents, um, as well as other errors like needle sticks and things like that. Okay. Moving along into starting to think about what to do, some warning signs of sleep deprivation, um, in case you're not able to, <laughs> to recognize it, would be falling asleep like during the day, during meetings, falling asleep right now. Um, this would be <laughs> probably a good time for a nap. Um, irritability and mood changes, that might be something that others might notice in you or you might start to notice in yourself sleeping too much on weekends or vacation. So, you know, are you spending all of, you know, most of your days off sleeping, really catching up on sleep, difficulty concentrating, or finding that you're apathetic or less compassionate. Um, I think it's really, uh, you know, I think this is probably the psychologist <laughs> in me speaking, but I think it can be helpful to help each other look out for signs of fatigue in each other and see what you can do to, to help each other out with that. I think that's also imp important because there is some research um, that was done with medical residents um, that uh, showed that even when they thought they were staying awake during call, um, they're most of the time when they said they were staying awake, they were actually falling asleep. Um, so when we're sleep deprived enough, we just fall asleep. And in general, people, um, we aren't good all the time at recognizing when we are asleep, um, especially if we are trying to stay awake. Um, so that's something to consider is, you know, giving people feedback that they are asleep even when they, they thought they weren't. All right, so what can we do? And I think to um, start to move into that, I'm gonna back up a little bit and give a tiny bit of background about sleep in general. And I think some of this will be reviewed, but just in case I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Um, you've probably seen the sleep stages before. Uh, we have stages ranging, ranging from deep sleep to lighter stages of sleep. And then REM sleep stands for rapid eye movement sleep um, in case 
you weren't um, aware of that, um, which is named for the kind of creepy looking way that our eyes move back and forth during this stage of sleep, um, which is usually where dreaming occurs as well. So um, this graph here shows the st stages of sleep um, ranging from awake, lighter stages of sleep down to the deepest stages of sleep uh, on the vertical axis. And then horizontal, we have um, how long we've been asleep from zero to eight. So over time, we're kind of going up and down through the stages of sleep. Um, and it takes about an hour and a half to go through a full stage of sleep, um, go through all the stages, but you'll see it varies throughout the night. So in the first half of the night, usually you'll go into the deepest sleep um, pretty quickly. And then REM sleep is often happening more in the second half of the night. And we find that we, we they serve slightly different purposes. And we need both the deep sleep and the REM sleep. So if you have been uh, kind of shortchanging one or the other, when you go to sleep, you might be more likely to go right into the one that you need. So you might see REM sleep happening earlier in the night right away if you've been kind of sleeping four hours um, and cutting off some of the REM. So you might go into REM sleep earlier. You might see things like that. Um, or, you know, if you're napping and you haven't been getting a lot of deep sleep, you're more likely to fall really quickly into a deep sleep, um, more quickly than you would um, otherwise during a short sleep period. All right, so the components of good sleep, I'm mostly going to talk about circadian rhythm and sleep drive, which are considered the sort of two driving factors of sleep. Um, but I think it's also important to consider uh, sleep opportunity, of course, that's what we've been talking about. So of course, having the, the window to sleep, giving yourself the opportunity to sleep, you can't have that, can't have sleep without it. Um, well, you could, um, but it's easier if you have it. And then arousal um, is essentially your level of alertness. Um, and you want that to be essentially to have good sleep. It's like these four things all have to align. It's like Orion's belt in the sky, the three stars that have to align, but there's four here. At the time that you have your sleep opportunity, you need to have your sleep drive that's high enough, your circadian rhythm telling you it's time to go to sleep, and then your arousal level needs to be low enough. So you need to be kind of calm, relaxed, not in fight or flight mode. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about that. So we have circadian rhythm and sleep drive regulating sleep. Um, and again, these um, to fall asleep and stay asleep, we kind of have to have those lined up at the same time. And you see throughout the day, um, sleep load is the same thing as sleep drive. Um, and that um, starts low. So when we wake up, we don't have a high sleep drive. Um, and throughout the day gets higher and higher, and then we'll sort of reset after you sleep. Um, so um, sleep drive is basically like our appetite for sleep and similar to appetite, the longer you go without eating, the more hungry that you're gonna get. And the same is true um, for sleep drive. And then we have our circadian rhythm, our internal body clock. Um, and that, um, you know, is sort of in synchrony with the sleep drive where it's low in the morning um, and then increases throughout the day. There is a little bit of a period in the afternoon where we're naturally um, more tired, where we're having those alerting signals that it might be time to sleep. Some evidence that we're kind of naturally um, supposed to have that afternoon nap or siesta, something along those lines. So again, to um, go to sleep, we want to have our sleep drive high and our internal body clock telling us it's time to go to sleep. Quickly about the circadian rhythm, I think is really interesting is that there is a pretty um, evenly split distribution naturally in the population in terms of like night owl people in the middle and morning people. Um, so your internal body clock might be a little different from, uh, from the person next to you in terms of, uh, in terms of what time your body um, thinks it's time to sleep. All right, so get into the good stuff. How do we minimize the effects of sleep deprivation? Because 
you know, we're health professionals and you all are residents doing surgery, some doing call, and sometimes this is, this is unavoidable. So the big things I'm gonna talk about are pre-banking sleep, the strategic use of caffeine, strategic use of naps, and overall good sleep hygiene. Um, so pre-banking sleep is um, recommended if you know you're gonna be going into a period where you're gonna have to stay up all night. Um, getting sleep ahead of time is a good idea. Um, recovery sleep also works, but that um, pre-banking sleep is gonna provide a nice buffer for some of those effects. So if you know um, that you're gonna be um, have to stay up um, for a period of time, taking a nap right before uh, is a good idea. So see if you can kind of fit that into the schedule somewhere. <laughs> All right, so, and then we'll get into some of the other options. Caffeine, um, we're all pretty familiar with. Um, but caffeine can help with fatigue and sleepiness. Um, there is some, um, it's been shown to have some impact on faster reaction time, though some people would say that we are making bad decisions faster uh, with caffeine, um, but it can be helpful for um, improving some of those cognitive effects of sleep deprivation. Some things to know about timing with caffeine, the effects are strongest within two to four hours after taking. Um, so, you know, time the caffeine for when you kind of most need it, when you're most tired, um, but also when you need to be most alert. So, um, you know, making sure to, to um, drink caffeine or take caffeine beforehand. Try not to take it too close to bedtime because again, you know, caffeine stays in the body um, even after that effect where it's strongest. Um, so, you know, leaving enough time in general, in general, we recommend that people not uh, use caffeine um, after like two in the afternoon if they're going to sleep at kind of like 9 p.m. or something like that. Um, so pretty big window is preferred, but we got to make things work. Um, and not taking too much. Um, 200 milligrams was found to enhance hand tremor in surgeons by basically a third. Um, and you probably don't want that. Um, and um, just for reference, a Starbucks Grande brewed coffee is 320 milligrams. Um, so we're not talking about a huge amount that might have effects on um, things like that. All right, naps are gonna be a great way to recover from sleep deprivation. Um, even short naps, like five to 15 minutes, have been shown to have um, a positive effect on the cognitive impairments that we see from sleep deprivation. Um, one of the things to note with naps that you have probably experienced uh, is the feeling of sleep inertia. Um, so uh, when we are asleep, we wanna stay asleep. <laughs> uh, so when we wake up, um, especially if we're sleep deprived and we need to really catch up on sleep and we're probably waking up before our body wants to, um, feeling grouse, uh, groggy, drowsy, disoriented, um, and you might have some of those cognitive um, impairments and impairments in performance when you're just waking up and transitioning from sleep to wake. Um, sleep inertia can last 15 to 60 minutes after waking, um, but sometimes longer. And even 30 minute naps can result in sleep inertia, especially when you're sleep deprived. Because like I said, you can go pretty quickly into really deep sleep. Um, and those cognitive impairments for sleep uh, during sleep inertia include speed um, and selective visual attention. And sleep inertia is gonna be more severe when you're waking out of your circadian night. So if you were kind of taking a nap at like 2 a.m., um, something like that, it might be harder to wake up. Um, doesn't mean that you can't, but just something to keep in mind. Uh, and from, again, that slow wave, deepest stages of sleep. Um, 
And again, from waking, um, if you are in a period of sleep deprivation, uh, it can also affect people with an evening chronotype more. So those night owl people um, might be more affected um, and they might find that it's really hard for them to get going in the morning anyway, if that's, you know, especially this kind of time. Uh, in the morning is uh, if you have any night owls <laughs> there, they might have a really hard time waking up in general um, and being being fully cognitively present um, for early morning things. It's a tough world out there for night owls. Um, and again, harder if you are habitually uh, chronically sleep deprived. Um, and poor uh, have poor sleep quality and greater sleep disturbance. So keeping in mind everything that we talked about about sleep and sleep inertia, how do we maximize naps? So again, the stars have to align, right? So if we want to maximize naps, so your ability to fall asleep and get um, some good sleep, if you're really sleep deprived, that can probably happen anytime. But the timing um, for many people is going to be better if it's uh, aligned with your circadian rhythm. Um, so um, between 2 to 5 a.m. and 2 to 5 p.m. are some of the recommended window blocks. But again, kind of working with your schedule, um, whenever you can nap, nap. Um, the length, you can do shorter naps, like 5 to 15 minutes if you need a small boost and you're short on time and you want to avoid that sleep inertia. Um, but 30 minutes um, is good too. There are some research that shows that there's not too much of a difference in terms of the improvements on um, cognition and stuff like that between a 30-minute nap versus a 60-minute nap. So basically, 30 minutes might be enough. Um, and keep sleep inertia in mind. Um, so think about those factors where sleep inertia might be um, more of an issue, like if you're sleeping during um, the nighttime and help yourself wake up if needed. So using alarms, using light, you know, access to bright light, access to, to daylight, um, getting up, moving around, fresh air, all those things to kind of help yourself wake up. Um, and then um, timing of caffeine. So again, caffeine takes like a little one to two hours to sort of kick in. So you can take some caffeine right before your nap, take a little nap. Um, and then um, after the nap, you should have a little time for that sleep inertia to get rolling, the caffeine to fully kick in, and then you should be at sort of your cognitive peak um, a little bit after the nap. Sleep environment. Um, generally, we recommend, and the same is true of naps, cool, dark place. Um, if you have trouble, if you want to nap, like to kind of free bank sleep and you have trouble napping, um, you might find that you want to prioritize having a space where you prioritize sleep and not other activities. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, and this is definitely something that we use a lot um, in, our, in our therapy work. Um, that um, we, you've all probably heard of Pavlov's dogs, learned a little bit about conditioning, reinforcement. Uh, the same is true for sleep, where we have associations with the bed, bed space. If you're trying to sleep in a space um, that is different, you might not have that kind of automatic association, which might make it easier to sleep. So if you have a space that's sort of reserved for sleep, um, it can make it easier because you go in, you lay down, you know, head hits the pillow and you know it's time for sleep. So the stronger that association is, that can help with uh, napping too. Okay, so some of the things to think about with sleep de deprivation improving sleep are going to be, you know, kind of individual, you know, maybe to, to your um, department, but also to each one of you individually. So really thinking about what's getting in the way of your sleep. Why are you not getting enough sleep either, you know, chronically or, you know, having nights of, of sleep deprivation. And that's going to impact what you might want to do. Um, so sleep opportunity, definitely a big one. So do you have time to sleep essentially, or, uh, 
or not. Um, and you know, if you have an overnight call, something like that, and you're expected to stay awake, um, you know, that's an, op an example of sleep opportunity. Um, but hopefully that's not going to be all the time. And you, so you can use these other uh, things I talked about to manage it. But if you're thinking about um, more chronic sleep restriction, you know, finding ways to increase your sleep opportunity, um, thinking about what parts of your schedule are changeable and which are not. I know this is a really hard one. Um, other things that might be getting in the way, are you having difficulty sleeping or winding down at night? A lot of people struggle with that, especially if um, you know, you're working long hours and you get home at 9 p.m. and then it can be hard to, you know, that arousal component can be hard to transition. Um, so following sleep hygiene recommendations, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, having a specific wind down routine um, can be really um, important to start to bring that arousal level down um, to go to sleep and stay asleep. If you're sleep deprived, you might find that you fall asleep really quickly, but um, you might find that you're waking up later. Um, so finding ways to wind down beforehand. Um, sometimes we see, especially, uh, I think there's a lot of research on this in the general population, sleep can be a low priority, um, or sometimes there's revenge bedtime procrastination. So essentially, you know, you don't have a lot of free time. This is your only free time. And you're like, I just want to, I just want to, you know, play on my phone for a little bit. And then a little bit turns into like two hours or something like that. Um, so, um, thinking about why sleep is a priority for you, uh, might be helpful, you know, which of these things really resonated with you. Um, and, um, thinking about that, making it a priority and then setting yourself up for success. And we'll talk a little bit more about this too. You know, as psychologists, we're experts in human behavior. Um, and we know that, um, you know, the, the kind of secret to, to behavior is that we're going to do the easier thing. Um, and so, um, you know, how can you set your future self up so that it's kind of an opt out situation versus an opt in? How do we make, um, how do we make sleep non optional? How do we set everything up so that I'm going to go to sleep at this time if that is an issue? Um, you know, maybe it's setting an alarm. If you have an issue with kind of staying up, scrolling on your phone at night, setting an alarm that has a reminder of like, stop scrolling, go to bed. Um, maybe set multiple alarms if you need to. Have someone um, help you with accountability, uh, things like that. And then sleep disorders are worth mentioning. I don't have time today to go into all the sleep disorders and treatments for sleep disorders. Um, but if you think that you might have one, it would be a good idea to get that checked out and treated. Um, and, um, you know, that's something to think about in terms of something like chronic insomnia um, would be if you have trouble, if you have the opportunity to sleep, but you find that you can't fall asleep um, or have trouble staying asleep for three nights a week for three months. Um, that's the diagnostic criteria for chronic insomnia. So if you think that might be affecting you, please talk to somebody. Your primary care doctor is a good place to start. All right, so sleep hygiene. These are kind of the basics of like, Eat your, eat your fruits and vegetables every day, wash your hands, like our, our foundation for good sleep, but can also be, um, be helpful in terms of having a good foundation if you know you're going to be having um, sleep deprivation. Um, so some of these things you'll see um, align with other things we talked about. So having regular meal times is something that strengthens our circadian rhythm. Um, don't drink alcohol too close to bedtime. Alcohol has a negative effect on sleep um, and can make it um, lower quality sleep, wake you up throughout the night. Um, daytime light exposure and decreasing evening light exposure, I'll talk a little bit more about, um, but that's something that's really important for regulating our circadian rhythm. Uh, timing and caffeine, again, I talked about, caffeine can uh, make it hard to fall asleep. 
because that's impacting your sleep drive. Um, having that wind down time to bring down the uh, your level of arousal, feel relaxed and ready for bed. I talked a little bit already about bed associations, but having, um, having a space that's reserved for sleeping and has that sleep association uh, can make it easier to sleep. It can be sort of a confusing signal mess if you if your bed or your bedroom is associated with all sorts of other things with stress, with being on your phone, um, that can make it hard to sleep keeping a regular schedule, again, circadian rhythm, um, and tobacco and nicotine um, can uh, negatively impact sleep. So that might be something to think about. And a little bit more about light because I think this is really interesting and I love it. Um, so we've heard, I think there's a lot in the media about um, screen time and screen time at night um, and that messing with sleep. And some of the newer research um, has been showing that uh, access to morning light can mitigate some of those effects. Um, so yes, light at night can negatively impact our sleep, but if you get enough light during the morning and the day, it probably doesn't affect you as much. Um, so that's something to think about. There's some interesting research as well about people who work, uh, office workers that work next to a window um, have been shown to have better sleep at night than those who don't have a window. So really important. All right. So also you got a psychologist to do this talk. So one of the things that we know about behavior and behavior change is that education and knowledge are often not enough to make a change. Um, so we also want to think about building motivation. So this is kind of for each one of you to think about individually. Um, you know, why would it be important for you to make a change in your sleep and your sleep habits and what you're doing around sleep deprivation? Um, and I can't say what exactly that change will be. That'll be up to each of you. But think about what, what is motivating you and what is the change that you'd like to see? there can be a lot of barriers to change. Um, you know, you guys are all doing, working hard, doing a lot. There might be some things that you aren't able to change with your schedule, other external factors, having young children that are going to impact sleep. Um, so the, what are those things that are unchangeable? There's always, you know, uh, change is hard sort of barrier. Um, and then reasons to change. Maybe you're noticing um, that you're irritable with your loved ones or your colleagues, and you know that's not something that you want. Um, that's important to you. Um, maybe you want to have better work performance. Um, do you want to improve your health? And so, you know, what's sort of the where are the scales at? Are the reasons to change outweighing the barriers to change? And then changing sleep habits. So this is the next step when you have motivation, you have reasons to change, and then what do you do? Um, and making SMART goals is definitely um, going to help you along the way. So they should be specific. They should be measurable. They should be achievable. I think this is a big one um, when I'm working on goal setting with folks. Um, go smaller, go small, small steps um, are going to be good. Go smaller than you think you want to. You know, it can be that you're going to bed five minutes earlier for the next week and then five minutes more, you know, it can be really small. Um, and that can be helpful to sort of build that momentum, build that confidence. And I'm sure you all um, have seen this as well in other areas um, that making big drastic changes um, can often be short-lived. You know, we're in the new year. We know that most people don't, uh, don't complete their new year's resolutions. And um, most people go too big. It's not achievable. It's not realistic. Um, we don't need to make a huge drastic change. What is What are the small changes that we can make that are going to be sustainable over time and start to build those habits first? And then timely. 
make sure that you set a time. Um, if you have a vague goal about changing your sleep and there's no time, you know, you can keep pushing it off. But if you say, you know, I'm going to start going to bed 10 minutes earlier today, today I'm going to set my bedtime of 9 p.m. and I'm going to set an alarm at 8 p.m. that says start winding down and making your way towards bed, um, then that would be a good specific measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goal. Um, and I can definitely talk about some more goal examples um, if helpful as well. Um, but it could be that you set an alarm right now um, for when you want to get off your phone at night and have it repeat every day. Um, and some final thoughts about changing sleep habits that I want to leave you with to maybe think about, maybe brainstorm with each other, maybe talk about what you can do in your department um, to help everyone. Um, is it a goal for you to change your sleep habits and why? What's, what are your values? Why would this be important to you? What would be different in your life if you changed your sleep habits? Would it be your relationships, your work, your health? Um, and what's one small thing that you can do today or tonight to work towards your goals? All right, thank you. And I will open it up to questions. Go thank you. Too, in case yeah. you wanna think about it. <laughs> we certainly have time for questions. Um, you can um, just feel free to chime in. Oh, I see Dr. Bauer has her virtual hand raised. Thanks for this talk. Uh, I had a question on one of your graphs. It made yes. it seem it made it seem like if you're not going to get seven hours, you should probably get six hours, or if you're not going to get eight hours, you should probably get six hours because of the wakefulness that occurs around six hours. Oh, uh, so no. if you're not going to get into that REM sleep, are you better off uh, waking up at a better time? And and I guess could you shed your thoughts on some of those sleep aids and apps and wrist bracelets that can detect that wakefulness so mm. that so that you're not you know waking up right in the middle of REM sleep where it might be harder to wake up so um that's a good question i would not hold this graph too closely because this is like an average normal sleep architecture um so especially if there's anything kind of going on with your sleep or you're having nights of sleep deprivation this is going to look a little bit different so it's going to be potentially hard to time that sort of thing. I think in general, getting as much, I would recommend getting as much sleep as you can <laughs> um, and not trying to cut it short to like avoid going into any type of sleep. But if anything, I would recommend doing it in increments of, you know, if you're going over a half hour. I would recommend doing an hour and a half so that you get a full sleep cycle. So increments of an hour and a half can be helpful if you're thinking about that sleep cycle. Um, the wearables don't have a, a super great reputation. I didn't, you know, prepare the research on, on wearables um, for today, but they aren't super great at actually detecting um, you know, whether you're in deep sleep versus REM. So that isn't super reliable, just so you know. <laughs> Did I answer that question? Any follow-up questions? Yes, thank you. Any other questions? I have, um, I have a couple. Oh, Dr. or Nate Davies, Dr. Davies. Is that Jonah? Um, yeah, so I just had a quick question. I wondered if you'd seen any research on having like consistent sleep versus like um, like you you were saying get seven hours a night versus getting like five one night and then nine the next. Mm -hmm. uh, so there isn't great research on that because it's kind of hard to study that. Um, but in general, we know that it's good to have more regular sleep. Um, and but if you have five hours and seven hours, and um, that's going to be better than if you have five hours every night. Um, yeah, or six hours every night. So a little bit of, of swinging might be necessary, um, but we don't know a lot about the, the effects of that. Um, yeah. Dr. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say thanks. Uh, so we have rotations where we're rapidly cycling between days and nights, like, yeah. you know, weeks, days, and then, you know, one day transition, then back to, you know, a week of nights, et cetera. What recommendations do you have for that sort of rapid sleep cycling? Yeah. So you're, and are you, is it switching between days or from week to week? Uh, both. Both. Okay. <laughs> So what we recommend for people that are kind of switching back and forth and doing like shift work, things like that, um, is to have a core, um, one of the important things is have a core hours that you're sleeping if you can. So some overlap and as much overlap as you can. So if you can make like 2, 2 a.m. to to 4 a.m., you know, have some kind of core where you're, where you're sleeping. And even if that might be a nap, um, that can help with some of the circadian rhythm disorientation and these sorts of things. Um, in cases of shift work, this is also where melatonin um, can play a role. A lot of the over-counter stuff is way too high a dose. The dosing on melatonin um, needs to be really small. Um, so find the smallest dose that you can, or find, uh, find someone to prescribe you a small dose. Um, the VA, I know the VA, um, uh, pharmacy has melatonin. It's also more regulated that way as opposed to over the counter. Um, but, um, melatonin could be something that timed, um, especially if you're trying to sleep at night at during the day when it's not your natural circadian rhythm, melatonin is, um, something that works on that, um, internal body clock signal. So taking it before you want to sleep, um, during a time that isn't your natural sleep can help. Um, so yeah, it's a core sleep time and melatonin are the biggest recommendations for dealing with a shifting sleep schedule along with, you know, a lot of the other things mentioned here, whatever you can, um, whatever you can implement, <laughs> I would recommend. I, I have a, um, a couple of questions. One of them was, I don't know if there's any research on it, but, but many, many years ago, um, when I was um, taking every other night call, I had a chief resident that would always tell us um, to either consider a cool shower, um, you know, on those stretches when we were up all night or a, a brief bout of exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I recall that they actually seem to work um, and, you know, there's no downside in terms of just, you know, getting your focus back and feeling a little bit refreshed. Um, he would always say either of those was worth an extra couple of hours of sleep or equivalent yeah. to. Yeah, I could see how, um, yeah, either of those could work to keep your keep yourself awake. Exercise is definitely something. It's kind of like the opposite of anything that you would do to sort of relax yourself and get ready to for bed. You know, exercise is good um, to stay up. And the cold shower, you definitely don't want a hot shower. So circadian rhythm is really linked to our internal body temperature. Um, so that's why a cold shower can help um, trick your body into, into thinking that it's not time for bed. Um, a warm shower, warm bath is something that we recommend before bed to sort of, um, help. Um, but a cold shower would do the opposite. And, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is your area of expertise, but I, th I think we all know that the, um, medicines to help us sleep, they're all potentially addictive, at least as far as I know. And yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. No one should be taking those on a regular basis, but um, I've read a lot and I'm sure we all have about the medications that are out there now to keep you awake that are not sort of the classic things like methamphetamines, um, mm -hmm. things like modafinil. I've read that police use them. The military uses it. Um, are those medications useful at all? Are they safe? Yeah, it seems like the research on modafinil is um, similar to caffeine, um, so that does help with um, keeping you awake and improving those cognitive uh, cognitive pieces. Um, so yeah, something like that um, could be used to help stay awake. Um, I totally agree with you on the other end. The sleep aids are not great. Ambien has a lot of side effects, and it's going to be hard with 
the schedules that you all are dealing with because it's gonna you know you get a lot of sleep inertia grogginess and stuff with something like Ambien um and sometimes some weird sleep side effects like sleepwalking um so I would probably not recommend something like that um yeah and they are um they do develop dependence so you'll need you know more over time and can become addictive but yeah, I'm not a medication prescriber. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank, thank you, really appreciate that. Yeah. It's an important topic. It's something that our um, ACGME um, requires we discuss, and I, I think it's something that could uh, benefit all of us. So uh, appreciate it, Dr. K. Yeah, yeah, and let me put my, if I can find the chat again, um, I'll put my, email in the chat um, if anybody wants to reach out to me at a later point that's perfectly fine talk about some of these things um, i'm happy to chat more answer any further questions and dr prabha prabhaka thank you appreciate it Pooj. you're looking forward to our future grand rounds this year everybody have a, a great day um, and a great 2023 thank you thank you, thank you all.